Good morning, happy Monday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect as usual. I had a great day yesterday, had a bunch of calls from people I haven't gotten to talk to in a really long time, <coughs> including uh, Christian Wonders, who is a pitching coach with the uh, San Diego Padres. We had a great time, me and, and he and Mike Camp Camparini, all on the same call, breaking down pitching, pitching motions, seeing some really, really amazing, amazing things. Um, in regards to throwing mechanics and uh, just applying the model. So I had a great time there. Just had to let that out a little bit because I had so, so much fun. But let's dive into some Q&A for Monday. Um, got a couple of really, really useful questions, I think. Um, the first one comes from Jake, and Jake wants to know about breathing in a resting state. And he said, I would be hugely grateful if you could upload a video explaining how, how to breathe in a resting state outside of performing resets. And the thing that, it, that I would offer you, Jake, is that, that normal breathing should just be basic, quiet, nasal breathing under most circumstances. So I don't try to make people breathe any particular way other than during some form of, of rehabilitative situation, homework or training based type breathing where we're working on sequence and, and strategy and such. Breathing behaviors are learned behaviors. And, and so, what we want to do is we, we have to do enough work to make the changes that are desired, but to become obsessive about trying to be uh, breathing in a very specific way all the time is much like trying to capture whatever good posture may be because there is it's ill-defined. What we're actually trying to do, Jake, is we're trying to restore the adaptability. So I should be able to breathe in many different ways under many different circumstances. And in most cases, people are arrested in one direction or the other. So if we look at, at the representations of, of the, the two archetypes in the axial skeleton, so if I'm biased towards an exhalation strategy with a compensatory inhalation, or I'm biased towards an inhalation strategy with a compensatory exhalation, I'm just biased at one end of this breathing spectrum. If I can capture the opposing strategy, then I typically have everything that falls in between. And, and so that's ultimately the goal. And so we need to do enough work on a regular basis where, where we restore that capability of the full excursion of breathing. Beyond that, maybe an occasional reinforcement periodically, especially if you're one of those people that has to assume a static position all day. So if I'm a desk, desk worker, or if I have to stand in a certain position, then my movement is limited throughout the day, or if I've superimposed compensatory strategies on there from a performance standpoint and I'm trying to maintain some element of health, then maybe I need to reinforce it periodically. But in general, Jake, what you wanna do is you wanna do enough work that you get the outcome that you desire. And, and so again, there's the, we, we're in the gray with this answer. It's not an absolute thing, but typically, typically, um, when you're at rest, it's just normal, quiet nasal breathing. You should be able to, to, to access that without the compensatory strategies. If you have to, then that might be an answer as to why maybe you're having a performance related issue or, or um, dealing with some sort of movement limitation. So hopefully that answers that question for you, Jake. My next question comes from Jason. And so Jason asked, asked a, a question about, about some, some groin related pain. And he's talking about specifically about, about groin related pain in clients and athletes. And, and, he's, and he asks, um, would I be correct in thinking that we would need to eccentrically orient the adductors by closing the pelvic outlet to increase the available range of motion? And on the contrary, would I need to concentrically orient the adductors by widening the pelvic outlet? Otherwise, is addressing this issue largely based on giving the client access to whatever range of motion or orientation they have lost? Generally, I think you've just answered your own question there, there Jason, but, but let's go through this a little bit so we have some, some, some more clarity because it's not as simple as, as the way you've expressed it. And, 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 I, and I think that if we can expand your viewpoint of your model, then, then I think it will be helpful. So if we're looking at just the, the inlet and outlet as, as you described, so as I, as I widen the outlet, there are certain elements that will become concentrically oriented in, in this groin area, which is incredibly busy to begin with. And then if I, if I close the, the, the outlet, so if I narrow the outlet, so a narrow IPA, um, I will have certain elements that will eccentrically orient and concentrically orient. So, so let's just pick on the adductor magnus because it's easy, um, because it, it's probably more than, than even two muscles. 
Um, so it has a lot of different behaviors depending on what activities you're performing, but we can break it down into an ER element and an IR element. So if I was to, to narrow the IPA, which would be the, the closing, the, the pelvic outlet, if you will, I will get uh, an element of the adductor magnus that will eccentrically orient. So the internal rotation uh, component as it's typically described, would become eccentrically oriented, and that's going to allow a great deal of, of hip abduction, which is actually hip external rotation, will allow that to occur because the, the external rotation element of that same muscle, uh, again, it's a different muscle if you ask me, it was just poorly named. Remember, humans are terrible at naming things. And so I have a concentric orientation of that aspect, which would reinforce my ability to abduct an ER. And so I think in general, um, Jason, your your like I said, your your final statement is correct. What we need to do is we need to look at this from the perspective of, hey, uh, we can call a diagnosis anything that you want. We can say that there's pain in this area and never knowing why it would be painful per se. Maybe there's a structural issue that we can sort of narrow things down to where we have some some sort of finding on a on a on a radiograph or MRI or something like that that that, that leads us in a direction and maybe we can blame some things on that. But in general, if, if we don't have any structural abnormalities and people do have pain, we'll just never know why they have pain in the first place. So then the goal is, is to restore this full movement capability. So can I orient the pelvis? Can I restore the relative motion to the pelvis, which is this full excursion of breathing? And so then I get normal eccentric orientation and concentric orientation of the, the surrounding musculature in the hip and the groin area. So. So again, I, I think that your model might be just a little oversimplified, but you've got the right, the right concept in mind. And so again, it's just a matter of restoring this full excursion of breathing, restoring the relative motion between the body segments, and that ultimately is the best shot you have at restoring health, comfort, and, and normal movement capabilities. So Jason, I, like I said, I think you're on it. Um, that's it for today. Have a great day, everybody. Um, I'm gonna finish my neuro coffee. It's time for a workout, and then we got other stuff to do today. So let's go get busy.